And good afternoon and welcome to our first of two OBOC events in 2020. My name is Laura Peacock and I'm the chair of the One Book One Community Committee, or as we affectionately call it, OBOC. On behalf of myself at Waterloo Public Library and our committee members, we would like to acknowledge that our spaces are located on the lands traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral People. We also acknowledge that our spaces are located on the Haldeman Tract and the traditional land of the Six Nations of the Grand River and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. If you'd like more information about the land on which you gather, please reach out to your local library. The One Book, One Community Committee has representatives from our four local libraries, Idea Exchange in Cambridge, Kitchener Public Library, Region of Waterloo Public Libraries, and Waterloo Public Library, along with representatives from Indigo Kitchener, Library Bound, Wordsworth Books, and community members. Over the last 19 years, the OBOC Committee has been fortunate to bring authors, including Wab sorry, including Richard Wagamese, Louise Penny, and now Wabgeshi Grace to our community. If you'd like more information about OBOC, or if you'd like to suggest a book for a future event, please reach out. Throughout today's event, if you have questions for our authors, please add them to the comments section on YouTube or Facebook. We are continually grateful for community partnerships that help make our OBOC events a reality, including longtime partners, the Waterloo Region Record and the Wolper Hotel. I would now like to welcome Jim Poling, Editor-in-Chief of the Waterloo Region Record, to introduce our authors. Hello, uh, and thank you, uh, Laura, for that introduction. Um, hello, viewers. Welcome to the pandemic edition um, of One Book, One Community. Uh, as a journalist and voracious reader and newspaper editor, uh, thank you, viewers, for uh, joining us. This is such an important event, and I'd like to thank the libraries and the staff for their support of this event and for um, authors and artists who commit themselves to the, to the written word. Um, joining us today is uh, Wabishig Rice and Shuri uh, Demeline. Uh, Shuri will be uh, interviewing uh, Wab. Um, Wab is an author uh, and journalist, and that's really, really, uh, in, in my opinion, really important uh, to have uh, a novelist who understands the power of story and the power of reporting that goes into a story. Um, the, uh, it, it, it's so important to um, do the reporting and ask questions and, and unfold uh, all those events that, that go into a story so you can relate it to readers. Um, one of Wob's earliest experience in journalism was reporting for the uh, Anishinaabe News uh, newspaper. Um, um, that's really important uh, for the Indigenous community and important for the uh, community at large to understand and see stories that aren't getting uh, mainstream access and, and should. Um, for the majority of Wob's career in journalism, he worked at the CBC. Many of you may be familiar with uh, his hosting duties on uh, Up North. Uh, earlier this year in the spring, Wob left CBC to focus on full-time writing in his literary career. Uh, in 2012, he won an independent publisher's book award for his short story collection, Midnight Sweat, Sweat Lodge. Moon of the Crusted Snow, which we will be exploring today, is a national bestseller and winner of an Evergreen Award in 2019. Uh, Wob is originally from the, well, Waxossing First Nation near Perry Sound. Uh, he now splits his time uh, between Perry Sound and Sudbury. Uh, it would have been nice to have done this in person at, at the Walper. Um, I see here we are at the pandemic edition and certainly the uh, Wob's book is um, I think a good fit for the times we're in. Uh, joining Wob in conversation today is uh, Cherie, uh, an author herself. Um, Cherie has authored the 2017 Governor General's Award and Kirkus Prize for Young Readers um, novel called The Marrow Thieves um, and uh, Empire of the Wild in 2019, which is Indigo's number one best book. Uh, I think you'll find this um, question, and an uh, question and answer session an exploration with Cherie uh, illuminating, including um, a really interesting story about um, two post-apocalyptic uh, 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 authors and novels and how they came together and the symmetry between Cherie and Wob. 
So let me turn it over to Cherie. Um, thank you for joining us and um, fascinated to, to hear everything that, that will come next. Great, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with my really good friend, my cousin, Wabagijik Rice from Wasoxian First Nation. Uh, I, we actually, our communities are pretty close. We're about 40 minutes away. Uh, we share a territory. Uh, I'm from uh, the Métis community that settled uh, near Penetanguishene. Um, this is Anishinaabe land though, uh, it always has been. Uh, my community didn't settle here until the uh, early 1800s when we had to leave uh, Drummond Island and my family uh, left Manitoba, the Red River area. So uh, I'm incredible, great, incredibly grateful to be here on this territory again, to, to be back home, it feels great. And I'm so excited to talk to Wob. Uh, Wob and I have known each other for, oh my God, forever since he just had a really short ponytail. Now he's just, you know, he's got that long Indian flowing hair. Uh, so, so I'm really excited and I love this book. Who do the Crested Snow, super excited. It's right here. I did not even have to go get this. It was right on my desk because it's uh, in the very short pile of super important books that I need to uh, refer to all the time. So uh, yeah, let's let's get on with the conversation. I promise not to ask too many embarrassing things, Bob. <laughs> well, right on, Tumiguais uh, Siri and Tumiguais Jim for the intro. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is a huge honor to be here with you all today. Uh, big thanks to the One Book One Community uh, Committee for inviting me to uh, visit you all virtually. Uh, when I was first contacted about this, of course, it was a, a big honor and I was very pleased. And, and back then, you know, we had planned out this sort of week of events in, in uh, Waterloo region. Uh, but lo and behold, everybody knows what happened. And uh, we did sort of the next best thing. And here we are chatting virtually. And um, yeah, I'm very pleased to chat with Cherie. Uh, it, it's really interesting, like, you know, our, our sort of literary paths have, you know, intertwined for, you know, a long time now, probably 10 plus years. But, you know, we're bound by that that great, beautiful water that's known as Georgian Bay, right? And um, even when I was a kid, you know, we would go from Wasoxing down to Midland Penetang to to go out to to Bozale First Nation at Chimnasing and uh, I was very well aware of the uh, Métis community there and and perhaps we crossed paths in in some fashion when we were kids too you never know right uh, probably we used to go out and uh, liberate canoes from the cottagers <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if you were a part of that gang but uh... <laughs> I'm familiar with, with similar activities yeah for sure <laughs> yeah Sharia you know I I've You've been a mentor to me. I've looked up to you for a long time as a storyteller, and uh, this is just really cool. I'm, I'm really excited about chatting with you today. Yeah, this is awesome. Also, um, I'm not that old to the audience. Uh, Wob's being extra nice. I'm not, uh, you know, we're almost, no, we're not. We're not, you are younger than me, though, aren't you? No, I don't think too much, but I mean, you can, you can look up to people of all ages, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's your first lesson for the day. Yeah. <laughs> Oblock community. You can look up to people of all ages. I look up to Wob's kids. I don't know if yeah, if you any of you follow him on social media and you get to see these beautiful boys, but I saw the baby yesterday. I mean, I I, I stalked Sarah, his wife, uh, <laughs> waiting for this baby. I don't know if she felt like the pressure in the cosmos, but I finally got to see the little bundle held up in front of me and I just could not. It's a good thing that I am older and cannot have any more kids. Because after seeing that kid, I was like, oh my God, so cute, I want one. So I will settle for hugging your boys. Um, so about five years ago, you and I were in Banff together. Mm -hmm. About five years ago? Yeah, yeah. fall of 2015, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we were we were uh, the mentors for the Indigenous writing stream that came through, and there were some. That was a, an amazing group. Uh, yeah. Alicia Elliott was there as an emerging writer. Um, See, oh my, Lulu was there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, everyone was there, and and you know we had these beautiful uh, elders, and we had this beautiful space. We were at the painter's house, and uh, one day uh, Wob and I were talking, and I said, Wob, what are you working on? And he said, oh, I'm uh, working on this post-apocalyptic, like, Nishnabe story. And then I immediately, like, the fear settled in. And I was like, uh, he's like, what are you working on? And I was like, this post-apocalyptic Nishnabe Métis story. And then 
we were like, crap, like we're from the same territory. You know, we, we have very similar backgrounds. We both work for Anishinaabek News. Yeah. Um, and I was like, what if we're accidentally writing the same story? <laughs> Uh, it turns out we were not. I wrote the Marothese. Wab wrote Moon of the Crusted Snow. Um, although I do find that in a lot of ways, uh, they just they go together so beautifully. It's like, it's like our books are cousins too. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> but for for uh, Moon of the Crusted Snow, what was your sort of aha? Did you have an aha moment? What what was the inspiration, or was it kind of a collection of smaller moments? Um, it was probably a collection of smaller moments, and uh, I, I guess really it, it, it spans, you know, probably, you know, seven, eight years. And uh, the first moment really was uh, the big blackout of August of 2003. Um, you know, power is knocked out to a big chunk of uh, the eastern part of North America, right? So. Yeah. Uh, that day, uh, I was living in Toronto back then, but that day I was in Wisoxing visiting my brothers because we were house-sitting for my dad while he was on uh, holidays with our stepmom. And uh, power went out and we're like, okay, that's kind of weird for that to happen in the middle of the summer, but not totally weird. You know, we'll just sort of play it by ear. Uh, but then it sort of dragged on into the afternoon and uh, we thought, okay, this is a little bit strange, you know. Um, let's go into town and see what's going on. So we hopped in the car, took the 10 minute drive into Perry Sound and uh, all the power was out there too. So uh, we saw people we knew and asked around and they said, well, we're going around is that it's this huge blackout that's impacting like a big part of the, the continent. So we kind of had like a bit of a holy shit moment. We we're like, okay, you know, maybe this is like the big one. This is sort of the end kind of thing. And, yeah. um, you know, there's like no social media back then. We didn't really have cell phones. So there's no way to tap in anyway, because that would have all been blacked out. But uh, we went back to the res, back to our dad's place and just started making a plan. We're like, okay, what are we going to eat? Who are we going to connect with? You know, how are we going to get water and so on? And um, it was like really comforting to be there. And, and to be with my brothers and to know which family and friends we could go to if this was, in fact, like a world ending crisis. And um, it was really, you know, heartwarming, despite, you know, the confusion and mystery around the whole uh, moment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the power was out into the night and then we woke up the next morning. It was still out. And we're like, OK, let's get our fishing gear together because we thought that's how we we're going to have to eat from now on. Right. Uh -huh. We have to catch fish out of Georgian Bay, and that's going to be, you know, our future. <laughs> um, but I think right when we were getting ready to go uh, down, walk down to the water, um, the power came back on, and within, like, you know, 20 minutes, we were playing Xbox again. <laughs> <laughs> we, like, forgot immediately. But um, that always stuck with me, and then I went back to Toronto uh, to go back to work, and... Um, from then on, I was like, yeah, if this ever happens again, the first place I'm going is up the 400 to, to Wisoxing. You know, I'm going to the res because that's really, it felt like the safest place to be. Uh, so that's where the idea of a blackout and a world ending sort of uh, outage came from. And then, you know, I've always been a fan of like uh, post-apocalyptic and dystopian fiction. And, you know, since I was a teenager reading books like, uh, you know, Brave New World in 1984 and Lord of the Flies and so on. Uh, and then in, in a few years after that, after the blackout, I read uh, The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Um, but I thought about, you know, our own experience of this glimpse of a catastrophe on the res and, and how our response was way different than what happens in the book. Like in the book, they essentially get up and leave and, you know, uh, just essentially try to survive. You know, they're, they're yeah. escaping, you know, chaos. But we, you know, my brothers and I were like, OK, let's get together and let's figure out how to keep our community going and so on. And I thought that would be interesting to explore in, in a book. And, and I sort of had that idea sticking with me for a while. And I just kicked some ideas around and brainstormed for a few years. And then when we met in Banff um, for that program, that's when I actually first started putting words into sentences um, in, in my room there. So, you know, th those basically were was how it all gestated and how it all came together. But it was really, yeah, it was inspired by being in my community and, and just having that knowledge of, of our history and, you know, the, our traditional skills and, and, you know, um, ways of life really. And, and how I wanted to sort of document that and have a different approach to, you know, experiencing the end of the world. So that's how it all started. 
Absolutely. You know what? It's it's interesting that you say that because my first reaction uh, in reading Moon of the Crested Snow was I felt such a level of comfort, which seems like such an odd response to, you know, an end of the world narrative. Mm -hmm. But I did. I just felt I felt so comforted. I was like, right. Because I mean, and you and I and I, Rebecca Roanhorse, like a lot of people uh, you know, in the indigenous, the wider indigenous community that write about, you know, sort of end of days, talk about, you know, the, the fact that this is not new. We've survived an apocalypse. We, mm -hmm. we have those lessons. We know what to do. Um, and it, but it really hit home when you know just the daily uh, work of of you know Evan and keeping the community together and the family unit. Even mm -hmm. I felt really comforted because I you know I things were happening and there's little kids involved, which is all always like you know terror. Um, mm -hmm. But I just felt like they're going to be okay. Like their parents know what's going on. They're going to take care of them. We have those lessons. Um, what was the the theme or subject of the book that really required the most research, the most heavy lifting? Like for me with the Marrow Thieves, um, I sort of wrote this first draft and I had this idea of what the world was gonna look like, you know, with climate change and disease. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, my editor pointed out to me, cause I had, I think the, the Great Lakes, I had them empty, they were drained. And uh, they pointed out, you know, if the Great Lakes were actually empty, the entire continent would, sort of fall in on the tectonic plates, like it just couldn't sustain that. So I had to go and actually look up what would happen in this scenario. So mm -hmm. you actually need science kids <laughs> if you want to write a book. So for me, that was the part that, and it came after the first draft, but that was the research part. Did you have a lot of research to do and what, what subjects would it, was it for you? Oh yeah, for sure. And I just want to mention too, with the Marrow Thieves, you know, I, I I felt comfort reading that too because the response of the characters there is to come together, right? Yeah, to, find you know, home, make home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. in like so many other you know tropes about the end of the world, it's like the the hero alpha male dude, you know, leading everybody through it and and yeah. going alone and being the lone wolf. So yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wanted to make sure I, I mentioned that about the Marrow Thieves too. But mm -hmm. in, in terms of the research, uh. Because I placed it in far northern Ontario, I had to research that for sure. And, yeah. and, and you know, I'd originally thought about placing the community like on Georgian Bay, where we're from, right? Yeah. And, and I thought, you know, like the, the collapse would be much quicker and there would be, you know, more sudden danger if, if I put it there um, because this is the moment of the end of the world, right? And, yeah. Um, and and I wanted to sort of instill that um, that tension and that mystique of of not knowing what happened and being sort of isolated and and detached from the primary action to begin with, and, and that's why I wanted to put the community uh, up north. So in in that sense, I had to do a lot of research about that. And um, I'm glad Jim brought up uh, being a journalist because you know I've, I've traveled to a lot of northern communities uh, as a result of my CBC work um, in northern Manitoba and here in northern Ontario. So I, I, I had like some surface research done already because of you know the work I'd done in those communities, um, yeah. and that's like understanding you know using diesel generators for power, um, you know, when the ice roads go in, you know, how how much gets shipped in on in the plains when, when there's supplies coming in, uh, if it's just a flying community. And and then like infrastructure uh, advances and, and developments and how communities change when, you know, there's more reliable internet or more reliable electricity and so on. So um, I, I that's what I, did most of the research on, I think. And uh, I had a, fortunately, I, I was able to share my first draft with a bunch of people from the North. Um, Derek Fox is is one of them. He is from Bearskin Lake, for First Nation. He works with the Anishinaabe Aski Nation and um, just some other readers too, just to make sure I had like the far Northern way of life down, down right. Um, because yeah, that's really what has to be believable, you know. Like if, if you know, sure, I'm an indigenous person. I know what it's like to grow up on the res, but I don't. My my res is by no means remote or, or isolated, yeah. right? So yeah, it's about doing that proper research and that due diligence to make sure that you convey that way of life uh, in a respectful way, you know. Yeah, that's. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that is something that you know. I'm sure you come across. I come across. People assume that because you're indigenous you sort of have this carte blanche to, to write about, talk about, and represent all Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for sure there's some situations, you know, where, where you are sort of the lone Indigenous person and you try and navigate that respectfully. But, I mean, you sure as hell don't write stories that belong to other communities. 
Um, and when you're including those other communities, there's a lot of research that needs to be done. This isn't just, you know, we're native, so we can write about all native nations. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned, uh, like, I, I have a Cree character, and I did more research on that Cree character, just making sure, like, calling every Cree I knew, Crees that were related to me, Crees that I met once. I'm like, how do you spell this? Do you guys point with your lips? Like, I need to know. <laughs> Uh, because it's important because you want to be respectful and also it's good storytelling. I think yeah. that's the thing, right? That we don't talk about. When we talk about, um, you know, appropriation of voice, uh, you know, and who can tell whose stories is it's a better story if you understand it and if yeah. it comes from where, where it's supposed to come from. Oh, I absolutely agree. And if you think about the history of indigenous peoples on this continent, pre-contact, like there are international relations that happened, you know, um, yeah for thousands of years. And it was all about that mutual respect and understanding and obviously not a lot of respect either. There was a lot of conflict that happened too. Mm -hmm. um, but having that, you know, um, wherewithal to just understand that other perspective and make sure you do that properly. And, you know, part of that is acknowledging somebody else's space when you're in it. And yeah. that's happened forever on this land, right? That's, yep. that's what, you know, we have this modern adaptation of land acknowledgements, but, you know, that's about having respect for primarily the land itself, but the people who live with that land too, you know? Yep. And that's what, you know, in the Shinabe, obviously, uh, ideals are that we understand. And, and, you know, just having that care and respect for not only other nations, but also yourself, you know, because you represent yourself and you have to carry yourself and your people in, in that good way, you know? So, yeah. yeah, it's all about those relationships. And you know, I think it's really important for, I think, any storyteller to consider, but especially us as Indigenous storytellers, we, I think, have that responsibility to to bring cultures together and, and also to raise awareness. Absolutely. And that's actually, I was going to ask you about that specifically. Um, so I'll relate it to an example. Um, so when Canada Reads happened the year that uh, the Marrow Thieves was involved, I think it was two, two years ago, um, uh, I was doing a lot of, you do, I mean, back then the world was open. So we were physically traveling to places to do promotions. And I spent uh, a lot of time with someone, a writer who's now a very good friend of mine, Omar el Akkad, who wrote yeah, yeah. American War, who's just mm -hmm. brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but we would go and do these events and they wouldn't send us all together. So, you know, Omar and I would spend a, they'd, they'd pair us up, which was great because, you know, I'd love the guy and then other writers, but we would get on stage and um, with other, you know, writers and they would talk about plot and character development and publishing. And my questions were about pipelines and genocide and his questions were about war in the Middle East and terrorism. And we would get to the green room and we were exhausted. And, you know, one time we, I just turned to him and I was like, imagine being a white writer. Imagine how cool that would be if you could just talk about stories. Yeah. Do you feel that? Do you feel that a lot? Is that still, you know, a reality for us that we have to have all these extra concerns and and be able to talk about, you know, politically, just this entire world outside of our stories? I think it's getting better. Uh, it used to be a grind. I know when I first started out and and was doing that that circuit and doing events. Um, yeah. You know, it's. It, it was really eye-opening for me then in that I realized me being present in a space for a lot of those people, a lot of the non-Indigenous people, was the first time they'd ever really encountered a real-life Indigenous person, you know? Right. And and that was their opportunity, they believed, to just ask whatever they wanted about, you know, anything they wondered about Indigenous people or culture or history, anything like that. And I remember, you know, I went to one festival years ago. This was for for Legacy, my, my previous novel. And uh, I did this reading, had a great, uh, you know, Q&A with the host and just about the, you know, the book itself because they, the host had read it and so on. And then they opened it up to the audience. And the first question was, uh, so what do you think about the Indian Act and what we should do about it? You know, ah! <laughs> so it had, had nothing to do with anything that we we're talking about. But this person, you know, had an axe to grind about the Indian Act or something about uh, Indians and just wanted my perspective on that because... I was an accessible Indian for that, yeah. person, you know? So yeah, that's, I mean, and this was only like four or five years ago. It wasn't that long ago at all. So so thankfully things have improved. And, you know, I, I, I credit you obviously and a lot of other, you know, trailblazing indigenous authors who are out there on the circuit, uh, mm -hmm. you know, making sure people know that <laughs> they can't do this all the time. <laughs> kind of BS just to, you know, have this accessible Indian for your curiosity or whatever, you know? Um, <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, you know, th and, and you know, I think having Moon of the Crested Snow in a specific genre um, kind of helps too. And I think you, you may have experienced that with the Marothies, you know, being paired with Omar at those events would have been cool for that too. But, um, you know, it's not just like our stories that we write that are about trauma and history and the tragedies we overcome. Those are hugely important and, and we need more of those stories coming out. But I think it's also a good time for us as Indigenous storytellers to uh, flex our muscles in all genres as possible, you know, and, and that's why, you know, with Moon of the Crest of Snow being speculative and post-apocalyptic, I have, you know, been getting more of those comments about those elements specifically, which is fun, you know, like. Yeah, it's super it's fun. It's fun, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I So speaking of other books, do you read other books? Did, did you read other books when you were writing Moon of the Crest of Snow? Um, I think uh, I think the Marathies would came out while I was going through the, some of the last drafts, which was, yes. was great. <laughs> uh, but like as mentioned, the road inspired it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what the rest of the reading list would have been. Um, but I think for me, like if I'm not looking at a specific genre, just just studying the craft of of literary storytelling is important. And, yeah. And, reading all kinds of, of stories, you know, just to know how um, how a, a line works or how a paragraph works or just how, you know, different structures can be effective and, you know, how a different writer will show something instead of telling something. Um, yeah. So, like, I, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head that I read specifically, but I think just being an active reader constantly throughout the writing process is really important. I'm so jealous. I can't, I can't read when I'm writing something, which is probably why I write uh, like in a really short amount of time, just because I'm mm. desperate to get back to reading. Mm. Um, but I can read poetry because okay. I'm, I can't write poetry and I'm really friggin' jealous of poets <laughs> uh, because they have some of the most beautiful, profound work. And I'm like, I tried, so um, I tried writing poetry once um, at the behest of our auntie Lee Miracle. Oh, yeah. uh, and then I gave her the poems and she was like, Great, thanks for trying. Please never do this again. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I tend to read poetry, but um, uh, I, I do agree to to read voraciously, read wide widely, just you know, consume as much as you can, mm -hmm. and really study the craft. Do you have a process that you write by? Do you are you like a, a mapper, or are you like a fly by the seat of your pants guy? What do you do? Well, I'm definitely a mapper, okay. uh, and I think that's just because it could be because of my journalism background, you know, just just structuring everything out, and and you know, um, you know, ha having worked as a journalist, there are formats to each kind of of story you do, right? Whether yeah. it's a print or 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 TV or radio or web, and um, I, I think that was ingrained in me, and. Uh, it provided me an opportunity, I think, to be a little more focused because I don't necessarily know if I'm focused enough just to fly by the seat of my pants. And uh, I would probably end up like contradicting something within the plot or just yeah. literally like uh, messing up uh, a character's own sort of arc or, or anything like that. Right. So yeah. that was also due to like my own, I guess, time constraints, you know, having worked as a full time journalist, you know, right. I. I, I needed all the time I could get to, to write fiction. So I would plan it out ahead of time and then be like, okay, you know, I got to do this writing like in a short window, like, like you said, right? Yeah, yep. I have a short window to write it out. So I got to make sure I know what I'm talking about and how I want the story to go from start to finish. So like, I wouldn't say it's like a really elaborate or comprehensive sort of plan or, or sort of timeline, but I just make like point form of, of how each sort of chapter is going to look and then how, you know, it sort of leads up to a climax and so on. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think it all through and I commit the story to memory before I actually write it down. Wow. That's impressive. I, I am a, a mess, but um, <laughs> how, how closely, did the final draft resemble the map? Was it was it very different once you got everyone's voice in there? Uh, it, ch it changed a bit. Uh, the beginning and the ending were the same. Um, okay. And, and the, the, those those parts of the story didn't change at all. Uh, there was always going to be the part with with Justin Scott um, that was going to be sort of the main cause of conflict attention. Yeah. Um, but there were other things that uh, got reworked a little bit. Um, and, and thankfully I had a wonderful editor, Susan Renouf at ECW Press, who um, really helped me sort of, you know, build that tension a little better and, and trim the fat in, in effective ways. 
and really make it a, I guess from from start to finish, um, a better pace story. I think so. Yeah. So there wasn't a whole lot that had to be moved around or or sort of cut out, but there was a bit that got added into the second half of the book that um, I didn't originally include. So uh, yeah, like generally the, the the general structure was there. There was just you know a bit more meat on the bones uh, that was added. And was this always going to be a Wendigo story? Because I I full on read it and I'm like, oh my god, it's the Wendigo. But I'm allowed to talk about it because it's not winter and it's not dark. And it's, <laughs> that thing is terrifying. Yeah. So was it always going to be a Wendigo story? Yeah, I think so. Um, but that wasn't necessarily always clear to me um, ah. as, as I was writing it. You know, like it was always going to have this this you know manipulative, exploitative force of you know a colonizer sort of recolonizing indigenous lands, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and he comes in, you know, very much like a Wendigo. And and I don't know if I necessarily had an aha moment that that's the way it always was. And that was mm -hmm. those stories that were with me since childhood that, that you know, Justin Scott is clearly a Wendigo character. Um, but, you know, I heard those stories since, since I was a kid, you know, since I was a little kid, we've always known about the Wendigo and how, you know, we're not supposed to talk about it in winter and how we're not supposed to eat people, you know, or else yeah. we'll become a Wendigo ourselves. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, when it sort of came together in, in the end, um, that's why I wrote that sort of dream sequence of, of him, uh, Justin Scott turning into a Wendigo, right? Because it was just so clear to me that, you know, I had to write it that way. And that was sort of, not, not just, you know, an homage to my background as an Anishinaabe person, but just a way to really be proud of our stories and, and show um, their effectiveness and their viability in, in sort of a literary form, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, isn't it funny, though? I mean, there's so many times where I think I'm coming up with an original idea. I'm like, oh, man, this has never been done before. I'm so original. And write the story, no one knows. And then I'm like, oh shit, I grew up with a version of this story. Yeah. Or even the way you you write, which which I, I I love. Your your writing feels like home to me because it is home. Um, I remember um, when I first published, uh, Thompson Highway sent a letter to uh, Thetis Books, who we've both published with, a mm -hmm. great um, uh, Indigenous publisher out in BC, and he said. I, you know, I read this book, it was Red Rooms, it was my first book. I, I read this book and it was great. I don't know anything about this woman, um, but you know, you say that she's Métis, but her storytelling sounds in Anishinaabe. So hmm. I'm gonna assume that that's, that's where she's from. She's from one of those communities that's in Anishinaabe yeah. territory. And I was so in love with the fact that another person read it and saw home. And it, I did, it wasn't writing about our land. Yeah. I, I was just, it's the it's the format of the stories, right? Everything is circular and it comes back around and you repeat the parts that are the most important that have to get through. And that's mm -hmm. really evident in Moon of the Crested Snow. And I was wondering when you're writing and and you know, I know there's as many different answers as there are writers, do you have an audience in mind? Are you thinking about readers? And if you are, who is that first readership for you? That, that's a that's a really good question that I, I really have, have struggled to figure out how to answer over the years, as I'm sure you have, right? Because, yep. again, that's one of the questions we always get. Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Turning it against you. <laughs> but it's, it's no, I, I think it's an important discussion to have. And, yeah. and really, you know, it's it's a matter of, I think, you know, becoming introspective and you know, realizing what our purpose and role is as, as storytellers, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I sometimes have a hard time answering that because I, I don't really know. But what I would say is if I'm representing myself as an Anishinaabe storyteller and I'm writing about Anishinaabe things, like I'm first and foremost accountable to the Anishinaabe nation and to my community and to my family and, and you know, my fellow citizens or, or residents or whatever you want to say of, of Anishinaabe people, right? Mm -hmm. so I, I guess in that sense, that's who it is, you know, because yeah. I want to do those stories properly. And, and if I'm going to, you know, put, document those stories that we, you know, have been in our community since time immemorial and that are ingrained in us and mm -hmm. me and you, yeah. um, even though we may not realize it, if I'm trying to do those justice in the written form, and document them and sort of immortalize them in, in some weird way, like as long as paper is going to last, right? Yeah. Um, 
I have to do it properly and I have to make sure that um, I, I don't do any harm to, to the stories themselves, to the people that I heard them from and to the people that are going to hear these stories down the line. Right. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I guess the, the, the second part of that is, you know, who I want to receive them. And, and that is primarily, I would think, you know, fellow Nishnabur people to see themselves represented in that. But I also come from a settler background too. You know, my, my mom's uh, lineage goes back to the UK. So in, in that sense too, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, non-Indigenous people who are going to read these things and what they're going to learn and, and what they're going to do with that knowledge and those stories and, and how those stories can essentially bring people together, I guess, in some ways. So, you know, like, and again, I bring it back to ECW and, and Susan, who made sure that I would I made it a proudly Nishnabe story. And, you know, just to give her another shout out, like um, I wrote, you know, a little bit of Nishnabe Emo and into into the book, right? Mm -hmm. into, the, into the prose. And um, in earlier drafts, I would have like the character say something in Nishnabe Emo and then say it in English right after. So as if to translate it for the reader kind of right. thing. Right? But she said, like, don't do that all the time, you know, like make the reader figure it out on, on their own, you know, just have the Ojibwe in there. And then, you know, they should be able to figure out what's going on, you know, as a result of the action. So yeah. but it was really empowering. And I think that sort of solidifies my desire to make these as genuine as Nishinaabe stories as possible, you know. So, um, yeah. So to, to, to answer your question, I guess it would be, you know, fellow Nishinaabe. Those would be my who's who's top of mind when I'm writing these stories. Yeah, I you know, and it, and it's it's funny because it, it's not like you're not limiting. It, it's not limiting. And in fact, Anishinaabe stories mm -hmm. um, are meant, a lot of those stories that we are allowed to share are meant to be shared, yeah. right? So it's, so by saying that indigenous readership then is, is sort of the top of the list for who you're responsible for and who you want to accept these stories, does not in any way uh, mean that they're not for anyone else, because of course they are. Exactly. You know? Yeah, if you're, you're putting it out there, and I think through the lens of Anishinaabe storytelling, it's sort of the loudest amplification of that story, of that message, because mm -hmm. those stories are told in such a good way, and they're they're told in a way to you know to be gifts when when you're telling them. So I I love that. I I similarly, you know, my the Marrow Theos in particular was for Indigenous youth. It was um, for Two Spirit youth. Um, and it was, it was really just kind of a love letter. And yeah. I think, you know, and then the, to, for it to be accepted wider is, is so beautiful. I mean, you've had such tremendous, uh, success. We were talking about this. We did a run through, um, a quick run through yesterday, but, uh, I was talking to Wab. I said, Wab, do you remember when we were in Ottawa a few years ago and he was interviewing me as like the celebrity CBC reporter. Uh, and I was like the author and we were at the museum of civilization. And I can't remember which book of mine it was for. But anyways, we get there and we get, we, you know, we're sitting on stage and one person showed up to the, to the event. What, and it was a woman who had wandered in like looking for a quiet space where there was no people to breastfeed her child and then wandered into our audience as the only person. It was kind of like, oh shit, I guess. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna stay here and watch these poor <laughs> fools. And I thought about that moment when, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Wab and I um, were in an article for the New York Times, which was on the front page of the art section. Um, and I really remember that journey that mm -hmm. we had we had gone through, you know, and 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 how how we struggled and fought, and and we're so lucky that our elder, a lot of our elder uh, storytellers and writers are still with us, mm -hmm. and are still like they paved the way for us, and then are still there holding the brush to the yeah. side so we can go forward. So, yeah, and and like just to go back to that moment in Ottawa, I mean, and and you know, I, I'd known you for a bit by then, but yeah. it was just clear to me then that you had that really humble and and inherent spirit of storytelling in you, and that you know, obviously, you know, ego wasn't a factor whatsoever because <laughs> we did it anyway. We, we had, did it anyway. <laughs> we, we, we had the chat. We talked about your story, and yeah. uh, we went, the, you know, the full time. <laughs> Did. There was not a lot of audience questions, but we, no. we did it. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's what's important about where, where we come from and why we do yeah. what we do. And, and it's it's for the spirit of the story and the community. And, and sometimes, you know, one person will show up, sometimes 10, 20, 50 or whatever. But you do the same thing no matter what, right? Because yeah. every time you speak that story or speak your own truth or background, 
that is a triumph considering the history of this land and what happened to our ancestors, you know? Like, we were supposed to be doing these things. And the fact that you were in the Museum of Civilization echoing your heritage and the stories that inspired you, was just like, okay, you know, we, you know, not everybody else has caught up with us yet, but yeah. they're going to get there. And then they did with y your face in the New York Times, right? So, <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> Oh man, that was crazy. Um, I wanted to talk about, and we were uh, chatting before about the hunt, because the moose hunt uh, for my family starting in a couple of weeks. Um, in both of our work, hunting plays a, a really central role. And that's, of course, the practicality of it. And one of the reasons, you know, being home, being on your territory, it would be great uh, during such a time of strife because you can, you know, you can access food, you can be sustainable. Um, I was wondering if it also played any sort of symbolic role um, to have the hunt be so central uh, in Moon of the Crusted Snow? That's a great question. I, I think it, it sort of more or less was an extension or, you know, an element of the theme that I really wanted to get across of, of being on the land and sort of mm. having that connection with the land and understanding that everything around you can sustain your life if, if you know how to do it in a good way, right? Yeah. Um, and having you know i haven't been out on a moose hunt in a long long time and you know i i obviously i'm not going to go this year because things aren't uh aren't working as they usually do yeah. um and and yeah we also talked to it before we went live today about the moose hunt and uh you know i don't know what moose hunting season is because my relatives just go whenever because they can right? <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but like having that moment in there, it was just about, you know, the gifts that a moose is for your family and your community and, and you know, how you need to respect it and how you need to respect the land where it's from. And also that's really become evident in the last few months with the pandemic is I think early on, people really became aware of the disconnect between them and their food. Um, because we saw that panic buying happening at the grocery yeah. store, right? People weren't yeah. sure um, how much food was going to last. And I think even in a city like Sudbury, you know, most people here are reliant on food that gets trucked in from somewhere else. Yeah. And if that supply chain, you know, goes funky, then how are people going to eat if they don't know how to go into the bush and get food or medicine or whatever they need from the land, right? So yep. yeah, that, those hunting moments were just an extension of, of having you know, the characters out there in the land and, and just really uh, being themselves as Nishnabek, but being good stewards of the land and respecting it and, and having the land in return respect them, right? And, and sustain their lives. So yeah, yeah that was just one, one part of that whole theme that I think I wanted to get across. And I, I loved that it was positioned, the, the hunt was, you know, the first way that we see Evan, the first way that we, we understand uh, the connection and the ability. And it was so, again, it was, it was that comfort. It was, Okay, now we have a protagonist we know is going to have to walk a really tough road. Uh, do I want to stay with this character? Do I feel secure that, you know, as a reader, I'm going to be okay going on this journey? And 100% yes. As soon as that hunt happened, it was like, this, this man can provide. He's doing it in a good way. And I also really wanted to say, um, I so appreciate and I so loved, and you, you in your life you do this, but the the fact that you acknowledge that there are things that we are relearning that there are small steps that we're taking you know when you're learning the language i know you're on social media you know you talk about it like relearning that language and and you know not having an arrogance about it mm -hmm. and you know the characters are relearning and taking small steps and acknowledging that you know um it, it you don't have to be uh perfect you don't have to be fluent you don't have to be you know have all the knowledge to be valuable, to be beautiful, mm -hmm. to be to be a part of that community. Mm -hmm. So that was really important. Was that something that you consciously did, or was that sort of self reflective? Uh, probably both. Um, you know, I uh, well, <laughs> we we hear a lot about imposter syndrome. You know, when when we're talking, yes, about we do. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so like, I grew up with all this stuff, right? Like, yeah. I, I grew up in a house that didn't have any uh, hydro or running water, so I was in the bush from a very young age. But, you know, I left the res to go to university when I was 19 to go to Toronto. And I've I've been an urban person ever since. So um, I've lost a lot of that. Like, I, I don't maintain many of those habits, like hunting, as I mentioned, or fishing yeah. or, or medicine gathering as often as I probably should in the bush. So, um, you know, to write about that stuff, I think, and to have a lot of people read it, it sort of was 
an attempt at self-motivation to try to reconnect with these things, you know, yeah. if I'm going to be this, you know, Indian facing guy, uh, outward facing guy, um, I should, you know, keep up with these things. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm so fortunate that that's how I grew up. And yeah. you know, even, you know, like my mother wanting, you know, as a white person to raise us in the culture, you know, on the reserve, um, that was ingrained in me from a very early age. So, but it is like a humbling journey for everybody, you know, yeah. even, like the, the language speakers I know who I would consider fluent would never call themselves fluent. If they're second language speakers, they call themselves learners still, right? Yep. And I, and you know, I count one of my brothers as, as one of those people. So yeah, it's about that that humility that you should carry yourself with because there's always something more to learn. And there's, yep. you know, there are always ways to improve. And, and you know, um, it, it's just, I think a, a good way to, to sort of keep yourself in check. And, and yeah, I try to do that. Uh, almost every day and, and you know I wanted to reflect that in the characters in the story as well. I, I love it. I'm so uh, tired of you know and, and this actually there's so many books that are coming out from the indigenous uh, you know wider community um, are really pushing back against it but you know in the early days whenever we appeared and maybe this has to do with the fact that we weren't writing our own stories it, it was either like traditional Indians or like the really troubled, messed up Indians. And there was no in between. Like if you took a drink, you were on the bad side, yeah. you know? And, and then if you were traditional, you sort of spoke in this weird, like Lone Ranger <laughs> kind of broken English. And it, you know, it was just like all or nothing. Yeah. There was, there was not right. And, and there's no nuance and the community is so nuanced. Yeah. I mean, it, it's part of how we survive. I mean, you know, holding on to traditions, but tradition isn't history. It mm -hmm. also moves forward with us. That's why it's yeah. still relevant to your boys, to my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, get you to talk a bit about um, how, how friggin' scary it is, how closely the, the tone um, and even possibility of this book of Moon of the Crested Snow is you know, mirroring the times that we're in now, especially I would say um, when I got to the parts where uh, the chief and council were deciding whether or not they were going to tell the community um, just how bad, you know, it was that it wasn't just a, you know, a small power outage to try and contain the panic. Mm -hmm. And it really mirrored what happened with the, the pandemic and with mm -hmm. some politicians um, are saying, you know, well, we didn't want to this is terrible. I'm not quoting Trump in support. I'm just saying some asshole named Trump said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I didn't want to tell them because I didn't want to stir up panic, uh, which we know is, you know, most likely malarkey. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so I wanted to just get you to talk a bit about that because I mean, this was, you know, your imagination based on pieces that you were putting together and the world has sort of been like, thanks for the idea, Wab <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's been weird. Uh, yeah. You know, th this book came out two years ago, uh, yeah. and and you know, I writing it. Um, you know, I think fear is an important inspiration to draw from. You know, and, and yeah. I wrote about a lot of the things I was scared of. You know, I, I even though I, I said that blackout in two thousand three was comforting, it was still scary. You know, it was like, yeah. okay, is, is this the end of the world? Um, so I, I really. Uh, tapped into that and um for a while when i was writing it like in the years after we were at banff you know i was I, it kind of infects your mind a little bit too because every time the power went out i was like oh shit here we go this is it you yeah. know <laughs> uh, so like by the time my i was done with it by the time i handed my last draft back to ecw i was like okay you know i can switch turn my brain back over and right. try to live a normal life again. And I hadn't really considered any of that stuff until people started reading it. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't mind talking about all this stuff because, you know, I, I liked writing about it. It was fun, yeah. as scary as that was. Uh, but now it's like taking on a bit of a different tone. And, I, you know, honestly, I don't see too, too many similarities between the book and our current situation other than, you know, there was p panic buying at the beginning. Yeah. And, uh, but also just the general uh, mystery around it. Like, we don't know yet when this is all going to be over. Right. If, if it is at all, you know, or, or like our world has effectively ended. We're not going back to the way it was yep. you know, in February or January, right? Yep. Um, so, so yeah, like that, that's been, you know, interesting to, to experience. Um, 
and and I think hopefully uh, it just makes people think in a different way, you know. And you know, I, I'm sure you've uh, experienced this as well. Like people are coming to stories like that yeah. for some reason, and I think maybe you know because the Marothes obviously is very hopeful in the end too. It's about rebuilding, right? Yeah. And I think people maybe look for that. You know, they look for a bit of hope in these really dramatic and tragic stories and and if they find that then maybe it sort of gives them a glimmer a, a glimpse of light at the end of all this so yeah um that, that's sort of what would i what i think what, what yep. i hypothesize anyway but you know who knows <laughs> ever fancy you <laughs> what i hypothesize okay so i know we're getting uh we have about 10 minutes before we're going to turn it over to uh questions from our audience um, but I need to know what is next and when, sir, <laughs> I'm holding your feet to the fire. What, when, when do we get more? What's going on? Well, hopefully in, in about two years, uh, they'll, they'll be the next part of the story. Um, I, I didn't originally intend to write uh, a next part to this. Um, and, uh, but you know, thanks to the interest, thanks to readers, thanks to the mm -hmm. discussions they've been having. Um, you know, there was, uh, uh, interest and I got offered uh, a deal to to write the next part and I'm currently um, researching right now I'm um, doing that structuring as as we discussed earlier yeah and I hope to start writing really soon and then um, I have a first draft due next September so a year from now and then mm -hmm. the hope is the to have it out by the end of uh, 2022 so uh, just to give everybody a little sort of tidbit of what it is uh, it will be probably about 10 years in the future from the end of uh, Moon of the Crescent Snow. And it'll be a group of them um, going back to uh, Georgian Bay because you'll remember in, in the story, um, there's sort of, they've been a displaced people to the far north, right? So yeah, they're going back to see what's left of the world and to see if they can uh, reclaim their original homelands. So um, that's what, uh, that's where that's at at this point. I have goosebumps, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm genuinely so excited. Oh my God. And you know, and here's the thing I think, um, because I just um, uh, finished and the, I mean, the re press release hasn't gone out yet, but I did write a sequel to The Marrow Thieves, yeah. which I was not going to do. <laughs> I vehemently was like, this is the story. This is how it ends. Yeah. There's no way, like I'm not, everyone needs to figure out what they think happened next. And then the interest. And uh, for me, it was a lot of young people who were petitioning and Finding me on social. Oh yeah, they were. They created like um, uh, Instagram accounts for my characters in the book, and like Facebook accounts, and were like messaging me, like, "Please don't kill me." And I was like, "Oh my god, this is <laughs> these brilliant kids. So how can I not do something?" So, um, but the timeline of publishing is very difficult, right? So when you yeah. say two years, I mean, nobody call Wob and be like, "Hurry up, man." I mean, yeah. I will, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, that's how long it takes. It's such a, yeah. it's such a long process. Yeah. And so, um, you know, maybe we'll talk a bit about that because I'm sure there's, uh, before we go, there's uh, a lot of, there's always a lot of emerging writers or, or, or writers that, that uh, join literary events. Um, do you have any advice for, for uh, navigating the publishing world, which is the business side and it's totally separate from this beautiful creative side, yeah. you know, where we get to sit around full disclosure in your pajamas and, yeah. and write. Um, but there's the whole business side. Do you have any sort of uh, advice around around how that? Yeah, um, well, um, and speaking of the glamour, I only put the shirt on like five minutes before we went to jail. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> life is now. <laughs> Complaints over here. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I, I recently did this uh, webinar for the Writers Union um, that focused a, a lot on, on that. And uh, because it's so hard to know, right? Um, yeah. Like, I didn't know when, when I had a first draft of Midnight Sweat Lodge done. Um, I was like, where do I go from here, you know? And, and, and yeah, maybe you can shed some light on how that began with you with Red Rooms. Um, yeah. But I basically went to Thetis. Uh, Paul C. Sequaces let me know about, uh, because he was at the Canada Council for the Arts then. Yeah. And he let me know about Thetis and said, yo, try, try sending it to them. They may be interested. So what I would say is, you know, make sure you have uh, a manuscript done. Um, not a lot of publishers will uh, take, you know, a, an idea on spec if you're just starting out. So uh, make sure your story is finished. Uh, make sure that, you know, it's as polished as possible, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, the final product won't end up uh, the same as, as it began. Um, yeah. Because it will be edited for the better, you know, like an editor will help you make it a, a better uh, story. 
Um, but from there, like try to do some networking. And what I would say is like reach out to people like me and Cherie because we had people like Lee Miracle and Richard yeah. Wadhamies and, and Thompson Highway. Um, we were fortunate enough to be able to confide in those people and, and they very generously offered us guidance on, on where to go and what to do and how to navigate this weird publishing world. Because, you know, like most other institutions, it can be a hostile place, especially if you're a person from the so-called margins, right? Yep. So, you know, I don't want to speak too much for you, Sheree, but I know, no. uh, I know this is how you operate as well. Like, we always, you know, want to hear from aspiring writers and we're yep. only too happy to offer whatever uh, advice, uh, you know, we can share, you know. So, because it's like, it's it's hard to know where, where to begin. And, and like with Red Rooms, uh, like, how did that start with you? Um, so I had, I, I wrote the, the manuscript. So I had, um, I was really lucky. I spent my whole life with my mare, with my grandmother. Uh, she lived with us uh, right to the end. And um, she, we used to share a room. And so she would, we'd do these annoying things at night. So she would read Harlequin romance novels, kind of out loud, because English was not her first language, right? She spoke uh, midchief, a bit of French as well. So she uh, would sort of sound it out and she would listen to fiddle music on this shitty old AM radio, <laughs> throw me nuts. And I would write, but I would write all night. I still do, all night, lights on. So she would always be like, oh, my girl, turn the lights off. And I'm like, Listen, if I had to listen to seven chapters of like some guy with washboard abs sweeping this, you know, maiden up, then you're damn well gonna deal with like, I wouldn't say that to her. I would say, yes, Mayor, just, you know, give me another hour I'm writing. And so I, after all of those years, years and years of that, I made her this promise. I said, you know, one day, one day I promise, you know, this writing is gonna come to something. It will, it will not have been in vain all of these sleepless nights. Um, and so I, when I found out that she was passing, she was very ill, she was in her nineties and, you know, she had, sort of said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, I'm good. Uh, so I knew when she made up her mind about something, it was gonna happen quick. So I was like, oh my, okay, she's saying she's good, she's happy to go, I need to make good on this promise. So I sat down and I wrote uh, what became Red Rooms really, really fast, because I was trying to sort of beat the, beat the clock because she was very stubborn, you know, mm -hmm. like she, that was it. She had said, she, that's it, I had a certain amount of time. Um, and then I sent it into to Thetis because Thetis was publishing the books that I was reading. Cool. So because, you know, that's that you, you need to find a good fit. And to, for me, that was a good fit. It yeah. was these indigenous voices. It was, you know, very, um, I hate the word raw, but honest. They were very mm -hmm. honest um, and, and, you know, and beautiful. And so I sent it to them and uh, I very quickly got a response back from uh, <clears throat> Anita Large was the uh, editor mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and she said, yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to take this, the, the book. And I had only sent a piece of it, you know, so she's like, you know, send the rest because cool. you don't, you don't bombard them. You don't send the entire yeah. manuscript to begin with. Um, and so then I was able to, you know, call my mom and send her up to the hospital to tell my grandma that, you know, I'd written the book, that it was going to be wow. published and she passed away the next morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, you know, um, but it's such a, a triumphant story for me, you know, for both of us, I think, because she was the one who taught me how to tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, uh, you know, it sort of, it became, it was a very emotional, very quick process. And then after I learned the business of writing, mm -hmm. and I, I will say this, um, there are not enough uh, agents for writers. Mm -hmm. uh, you, who is your agent now, Wob? Denise Bukowski. Oh shit, mm -hmm. that's a good one. You got a big name. <laughs> Not even from the res anymore. <laughs> um, I have the Cook Agency, which is mm -hmm. you know uh, international, beautiful, been in the business for forever. Um, and and honestly, if you can get to the point where um, you know you can start looking for an agent, I would advise it. Mm -hmm. I um, have signed uh, deals not knowing that the work was going to be. I just imagined my career very small because I was writing these stories from my community. In here, yeah. You're, right, and you just don't even think about it. And I signed these deals and now I'm like, well, that was a huge mistake. And if I would have <laughs> had someone, you know, who had my back. So I would say, uh, you know, write, read as much as you can, write, write all the time, uh, polish it, just like Wob said, you, you get it to a point where it you cannot imagine you know, at that point, because you will go back in and make it better, but you cannot imagine that it can get any better, then send it in. Because that's, it's like your interview, right? It's the first time people are meeting you. Yeah. And do your research. Yeah. Start looking for publishers that, that you know, sort of write or are publishing what you, the way that you write or where you want to see your book and figure out the business a bit because it, it mm -hmm. can be 
very hostile yeah. uh, and very unfair, especially to creators uh, a lot of the time. So you just need to take care of yourself and each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like if somebody, honestly, if something were to happen, you know, with Wob and a deal, I'd be there. I'd be, they would have to call security, right? <laughs> like that's my cousin and also a writer I, I really, really respect. And so, you know, we as a community uh, try and look after each other, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It is tough. What is your favorite part of the whole process? Sort of from like the idea to the awards, because I can say that to you now. <laughs> the idea to the awards. But what is your favorite part of that whole, you know, process? Uh, I, 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 I really like uh, sharing it with people, having it out there, you know, and having people read it. Uh, because it, it starts as just this, like this one or two line idea in your head, just this maybe an image before it really becomes those words. That yeah. idea of a word, you know, yeah. um, and, and it grows into this this thing that you know keeps building and building, and eventually, you feel confident enough, and you feel like you have you know a fully formed story, and you write it down, and that's like a whole long process too. And and then you know if you're fortunate, you get a publisher on board, and then you work with an editor. Uh, but then when it's all done, like holding it in your hand is great because it's like oh wow, this started as just an idea. But just having people read it and going out to meet people and, and talk about it is, is really cool because different readers have different interpretations, you know, it resonates yeah. with different people in different ways. And I think, you know, that's when I really sort of understood just the power of art and, and how it can really bring people together, you know? So um, the, yeah. yeah, that's probably my favorite part is just sharing it with people and talking about it with people. Have you had um, where people, uh, you know, there's so many brilliant scholars, uh, uh, right now, especially from our communities, um, where people sort of send you those those thing, notes where they're like, so the symbolism of this aspect of the book really, like fully, like straight up academics find my work uh, <laughs> so much more symbolic and meaningful than yeah. I ever intended it. Like I'll write a funny story about a cousin and yeah. they're like, oh, the symbolism of that relationship and the way that they, <laughs> for example, liberated this canoe really talks about colonization. And I'm like, Yes, that's <laughs> fully what I intended it to be. These are not real people. <laughs> have people, have you started to get like sort of academics that, you know, going through your work and. Yeah. And, and the, the, you know, there was one really good example. I can't think of what it was, but I was like, okay, you know, yeah, go for it. <laughs> right? That sounds awesome. <laughs> I, <laughs> I said that. that in your review, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just said that too. People are like, what do you think about this? I'm like. That looks like a friggin' A plus to me. I mean, no one's gonna say you're lying. I'm not gonna say you're lying. Go for it. <laughs> oh man. I so I guess I want to make sure that we have time for uh, people's questions. Do we have questions, great administrator of OBOC? I don't know. Uh... That's a little bit more of a there we go than I any I'm one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go to some of the questions, I just have to say that myself and my colleague who are here working on the behind the scenes pieces, we have laughed so hard during the last hour. Cool. The <laughs> amount that you two clearly enjoy each other and enjoy talking with each other is just fantastic. So thank you so much for that. Our pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing us together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy to. It's worked out really, really well. And especially because originally when we started talking about what the, these old Bach events would look like, I mean, at that point, sure, you were living in Vancouver, so there's no way this ever would have been possible at that point. So, you know, yeah. time is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had lots of really, really positive comments come through, just thanking both of you for being here today and um, commenting both on how much they love the book and how much they've really appreciated the discussion. We've had lots of questions too. So some we can post directly on the screen so everyone watching will be able to read along, uh, but some of them are a little bit too lengthy so I won't be able to completely post them. Um, but since we kind of were talking uh, at the end about the writing process, one of the questions we received was, since you knew the ending going in, and this was directed to Wab, um, since you knew the ending going in, did you struggle with how to get there? Any times you got stuck with how the story would proceed? And if so, how did you get past that? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I did have this sort of resolution and, um, you know, I, I had this moment, you know, for those of you who read the book, you know what happens. And uh, so that was always going to be there. And I didn't necessarily feel totally hung up on um, 
just getting there at different points. Uh, but there were moments when I wondered about the sort of uh, believability of the whole story. And, and Shri touched on this uh, earlier with uh, the research you got to do, right? Um, so, and this is a, a part that has to deal with earlier on in the story um, when when Justin Scott shows up, right? Uh, you know, that was always going to be a, a key part of, of the plot, as I mentioned, you know, there was going to be this, this great sort of uh, terrorizer, essentially, who comes in. Um, but I thought after a while, you know, I, I was sitting down to write it. You know, I, I, I started writing in September of 2015 in Banff. And October rolled around and, you know, I was like a few thousand words in or I don't know how long, how far in I was at that point. But I started having serious doubts because it was coming up to Justin Scott's arrival. And I really wasn't sure if that was believable. And I thought, if that isn't, then I got to ditch this all together because nobody's going to want to read something that doesn't really make sense or is that believable to them. So uh, I was living in Ottawa at the time and my wife, Sarah, and I, uh, this was pre-kids, obviously. So we went to a Halloween party and um, I just started chatting with some dude there. And uh, because, you know, I was writing this post-apocalyptic story, the end of the world was, was all I was thinking about. So I must have really been a fun guy to chat with back then. <laughs> uh, I just started chatting with this dude and, uh, you know, we're talking about the end of the world. And he said, yeah, man, if, uh, if shit goes down, the first place I'm going is the reserve. And I said, oh yeah, which uh, which reserve? And he said, you know, the first one I can get to, you know, I'm just hopping in my truck and I'm going to the res. And I said, okay, you know, uh, why? And he said, well, you know, like people there know what to do and they know how to live on the land and I can hide out there and, and so on. And, you know, I didn't say this to him, but I thought like, you know, it's really presumptuous. You know, you just think you're gonna be able to go to the res and, uh, uh, you know, I sort of ended the conversation. What we we ended the conversation. I walked away, but then I was like, okay, bingo. There is one person in this world who thinks that way, so I can write about Justin Scott. There we go, right? So it was pretty liberating to have that. You know, that was an, another aha moment, I guess you could say. Um, but I guess you know, throughout the process, there are little things that come up, and uh, you just get stuck. And and what I do is just step away altogether. You know, I'll, I'll close the laptop, go for a walk put on some music, play guitar. Um, now I hang out with my kids, which is great. And uh, yeah, just sort of shutting down and detaching from the story for a little while really helps uh, work things out. Um, do, do you have methods, Sheree, to when you get stuck? Uh, I, I do the same. I have to walk away from it or you get you you can't move forward. You just dig yourself deeper for me. Um, and that's where I sort of, uh, I, I read and I read poetry because I because I do this thing where um, I'm very like susceptible. So like for example, I was reading. Uh, I thought, oh, it's safe to read something really different from what I'm writing. So I was reading uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Oh, cool. <laughs> right, by like Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. And I wrote a page after that in the manuscript I was working on, and I'm like, why does this elderly Indigenous person suddenly sound like Hunter S. Thompson? <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be really careful because I get really easily, because I love stories and I get really easily involved. So that's why I sort of turned to poetry mm. because, I, because as, as I said, I can't physically produce the stuff. Uh, mm. So it's safe for me to read it and be inspired. Um, yeah, but definitely I step away mm -hmm. uh, because you know where you, you know where you want to go. It might change. So you have to be open to the, you know, taking a different route. Uh, but you definitely need to also give the story space because it is really, and it sounds so cliche, but the story is its own beast, right? Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's coming from you, but it's, you're certainly not direct. I have tried to, you know, direct the details of my story away from the story itself. And uh, it, it's, well, those books were never published. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've had a few questions about the Scott character um, and kind of what he represents being an outsider coming in, whether he represents the personification of evil, um, having the, the Wendigo piece come in with that. Um, just so the questions really are kind of wondering a little bit more about whether there was any consideration for um, that character or what he represents being a member of the community or was he always going to be an outsider? Um, well, he was primarily supposed to be an allegory for colonialism, right? Uh, and and the whole story itself, I guess, is is in some ways too, in general. Uh, and he's 
pr primarily the antagonist, right? The the main antagonizing force in the story. And you know, it, often when you read, I guess, typical stories in the canon about disaster or you know, world's ending or so on, it's usually set up as you know, like people versus the chaos around them or people versus the land and, and that survival. Um, but I think with this story, you know, the people were very much uh, well suited to carrying on with just being on the land. Um, and if the power never came back on, you know, there would be some casualties, but eventually they would be good, you know, because they had been doing that for years, uh, decades, centuries prior. Um, and, and, you know, I think the story wouldn't have been wouldn't wouldn't have lasted that long otherwise. So uh, primarily, yeah, he was the antagonist. He had to come in in that sense. But also, you know, as as an allegory for colonialism, he represents you know exploiting people once again. You know, uh, and already displaced people. Um, and we see that you know happen uh, everywhere nowadays. People in the north, especially, you know, like they've already been removed from their homelands and they're sort of confined to these quote unquote reserved spaces, but their traditional territories continue to be exploited for resource extraction, you know, whether it's mining or forestry or whatever else. And then there are other forces that play too. You know, we hear stories about missionary work that's ongoing. You see last week about how, you know, there were the this one organization that had to do with the, you know, residential schooling up there in, in decades past, but was still doing these, these day camps and this extension of missionary work that was essentially teaching about uh, homosexuality as a sin, right? So, you know, this, these communities are still being exploited and still being manipulated in different ways. And, and Justin Scott is sort of, you know, a, a representation of how that still happens in, in current times, you know? So, um, you know, overcoming him, obviously, like those of you who've read it know what happens, but, you know, it, it sort of forces the community members to figure out what their priorities are. But at the same time, they welcome him in too, because that's the Anishinaabe way. You know, he is a person in need. And even though he has bad intentions, you know, they can't just turn him away at that point. And, and then the people that follow as well. So, you know, in, 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 in that sense, you know, I didn't want it to just be like a straight up black and white, good versus evil thing, um, because uh, that oversimplifies, you know, the life we live. It, it's not this binary. And then Sheree mentioned that earlier. There's this nuance that we really have to um, use to fill in the gaps that it, it just isn't that way for us as as Nishnavik. You know, our stories are very fully formed and they have a lot more detail. And, you know, they highlight the complexities of life. You know, this guy is bad and they know that he is, but they're not going to turn him away. They take him in anyways, right? So that opens up a whole other can of worms of problems. But, um yeah, that just sort of illustrates the complexity of modern Indigenous life, I think. I think just on a personal comment related to that, I think both of your novels showed that really well, that there was a trusting element where um, sometimes that really kind of backfired. You know, I think of um, kind of in the, the middle um, of your book, Cherie, when um, Frenchie ultimately um, shoots someone, you know, it's someone that they thought that they innately could trust, um, but then couldn't. So I thought that both novels really uh, played into kind of the trust element and then the outside uh, fear. And I, I don't know, I just personally, I thought that that was really well constructed in both of your books. So I just felt I needed to say that. Um, so another question from our audience, would either of you consider writing nonfiction? Go ahead, Shree. <laughs> oh my God. <clears throat> um, uh, wow. I've never, even, I, I have not considered it, obviously. Uh, um, I, here's, here's what I think. Um, so much of what I, I'm writing uh, is based in the truth. So, you know, the Marrow Thieves is just, it's just residential schools and that whole phenomenon moved into the, into the future a little bit. Uh, so that we can have a, a, a discussion about it from our perspective and from a from a, a position of strength, because you know, and, and this sort of is the theme throughout that, you know, even if we're on the run and even if we're makeshift, you know, sort of ha coming together and having a home, we we still are in the position of power on this land. Not power in that sort of Western sense, but you know, a power within ourselves, not over anyone else. But that no one then can take that position uh, over us. The fact that you know there's still language and there's still stories is a, is a triumph. 
Mm-hmm. Um, um, and uh, you know, Empire of Wild is 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 about just that. It's about it's about uh, missionaries and resource extraction companies and how they work in tandem. Um, you know, because you have to first get the people to be disconnected from the land in order to get the uh, approvals through the process to do extraction work to do uh, resource extraction and mining say for example that you have to sever that connection of the people and the way to do that one of the ways that that we know has been uh, you know semi-successful has been to send in missionaries where they then preach that you know poverty and and strife in the communities are a result of worshiping false gods not colonization ignore that part it's it's because you you know uh, aren't in talking to Jesus in this house and you're out on the land, which is, you know, sort of pagan. Um, so those are re- very real issues uh, and circumstances. And so I write about them in a, in a fictional way, but, you know, uh, uh, I can't write fiction without uh, so much of who we are uh, in it. And, and um, you know, it's just, it's like, so when I was learning stories, my, my grandmother, it was sort of like this. <clears throat> there were some stories that had to be told back exact. So, you know, that I knew where we came from, that I knew, you know, how we got from Drummond Island. The fact that we are not original to this land, that this is Anishinaabe land that we're on and, you know, that they welcomed us because we came from our community, that I know all of those maps. Those were the stories that I had to know exactly. And the other ones were that I had to understand what the lesson was, what the teaching was. And then I had to weave my own basket to carry that lesson in. So the, the basket is woven of words, right? So my whole experience has been taking those teachings, those lessons, the important things that make us who we are um, and finding a way to carry them Mm -hmm. in a way that allows me to share it and keep it safe. So so all of my stories are that basket. Mm -hmm. So I think there's already so much nonfiction in there that it really hadn't occurred to me um, to do nonfiction. Plus, I don't know that I'd be any good at it. I'm not very, you know, unbiased. I'm pretty... uh, (laughs) Also, I swear a lot, which you can get away with in fiction. I don't know about nonfiction. What about you, Bob? Are you going to write your memoirs? Uh, no, not not memoirs, I don't think. Because uh, I, I think that would be kind of boring. I, I wouldn't be excited <laughs> to write about myself, quite honestly. Um, but I think, like, I can't remember if it's Hunter S. Thompson or, or somebody like that who has a quote uh, that's along the lines of, um, fiction gets closer to the truth than journalism ever can. So that's yeah. what, you know, what you just mentioned reminded me of. Um, and I think as fiction writers, we were able to, you know, take those realities and, you know, take some, not necessarily liberties, but, um, you know, construct them in a way that can be a little bit more effective. And and I think of a, a recent book, a recent great book that I read uh, that, does this really well is uh, Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Oh yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's up for the Giller. Yeah, yeah, Giller. Yeah. It's it's a, a fictional uh, account of five residential school survivors, and it follows them all the way through life. And um, you know, there are some great stories about the residential school experience in the sort of modern nonfiction canon. But you know, by using fiction, you can really get into some nooks and crannies that uh, nonfiction may not necessarily be able to. And I think Michelle does that really excellently in that book. Um, but for me, like, I, I basically spent the last 18 years doing nonfiction every day uh, as a journalist. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, not in a literary sense at all, but, you know, I, I dealt with real life uh, stories every day. And, and I, I think I would eventually uh, at some point, uh, you know, try to write something nonfiction. Uh, but for now, you know, I'm kind of want to take a break from doing interviews and transcribing them and, and writing about them, right? So uh, yeah, maybe in like five, 10 years time, but um, not right away. Hold him to that. Come back in five, 10 years time and be <laughs> yeah. like, where is it, bro? <laughs> yeah, it's now on the record, so. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question that actually goes to both of you. Now that you've both revealed that there are sequels coming for um, for your novels, just wondering whether um, how you approach kind of the writing of a sequel after the first books were so successful. Is there greater pressure, uh, more uh, confidence in what uh, can actually be accomplished within that story? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great question, um, especially because I didn't plan on writing a sequel, right? Um, <laughs> and I spent like years thinking of this story, you know. So now I have like uh a year and a half basically to to dream up a whole other novel of of the second part of the story so um that's where the pressure is i think about actually doing the work 
not necessarily about it being received um, or, or, you know, how it'll do once it gets out. Like, all I can do is, is my best, you know, and, you know, I have to work as hard as I can to create a, a good next part to the story. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like, it's, it's a whole lot of research at this point and, and you know, then the writing comes. But um, you, you're much farther along, Sheree, uh, in terms of your sequel. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's draft one is done. And um, <clears throat> man, was that an exercise in terror. <laughs> so um, I've been so, so lucky. The whole reason I wrote YA was, um, you know, someone mentioned to me that if you write YA, there's a chance, there's a very slim chance, but it could happen that your book could end up in schools. Um, and so I thought, well, this is, I wrote, I wrote full disclosure. I mean, I wrote the Marathies in a fit of anger and frustration, right? Like I, and, and just this overwhelming sense of like, you know, we were dealing with so many, uh, young people, um, you know, who were deciding they no longer, uh, wanted to, to carry on in our communities. And, you know, so we were having these, uh, crises that were happening and I was, I was, you know, it just, and then there was this discussion that was happening whether it was residential schools really genocide. Like it was a question put forward. Like, like let's have a civil discussion about whether or not we tried to wipe out your entire community. Mm -hmm. And I was so frustrated and angry. And I, I sat down and I, you know, wrote the Marrow Thieves from that place of truly love. The anger was based off how much, you know, profound love there is in and for and of our communities. Um, but, uh, but it was sort of, that's how it was done. And I thought no one's going to read this cause it's like the most, you know, sort of, it was, it, it hit as close to the truth as I could get it. And so I thought it was, you know, very difficult and I thought, well, whatever, at least I got it out of me and I can sort of carry on. Um, and so I don't know because it happened in that very, uh, specific way. I was like, how can I, how do I replicate that process of like me angrily up for 20 hours straight? Uh, it turns out I just needed to watch the news um, <laughs> and it was fine. I was like, oh, right. Yeah, no, that's uh, colonization still happening. I'm good. Let's do this. Let's go. Um, but it was it was terrifying because now schools have taken uh, the Marothies. It's replaced To Kill a Mockingbird in a lot of school districts in Canada. Uh, and now down into the States, it's part of uh, curriculum from uh, elementary to university in some areas. And so I'm so uh, I had to turn off that part of my brain that rationally knew that this book meant uh, a lot to, to people. And I'm grateful. It's, I mean, it's, it's its own, again, it's its own entity. I'm, you know, it's done with me. Um, so I had to approach it in a way where I just pretended that I didn't know that, you know, people were waiting for it and were very serious about, you know, what I should do or what I shouldn't do. I, I got hate mail over, you know, one of the characters that I killed off. Uh, in the book, which was actually a scene I wrote in, in Banff, which was, you know, terrible, but um, yeah. I needed to happen. This, you know, child needed to die. And I, people really wrote me angry letters about it. So I was like, oh man, this could go really good or really bad. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I did the thing where I, like you, I was like, this is it. I'm not writing a sequel. This is a story. But when the readers um, respond in that way, and especially, to be honest, especially uh, Indigenous youth, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest and say that I'm not just a Canadian writer, that I am of, for, and by my community, that my responsibility lies with, with my family, my extended family, and, and, you know, everyone who, who is a part of, of this land, then, um, then I, if I'm going to say that, I'm going to go, like you said, if you're going to live and present yourself in that way, then you have to recognize that there are responsibilities that come mm -hmm. with it. Um, that you're not just a Canadian writer, and so you do have those responsibilities. So it's at the the short answer is terror. It was not <laughs> like, oh, this is going to be easy, and this is what I'm going to do. It was like, holy shit, what have I done? I can't believe I agreed to this. But uh, but also, I don't know, um, Wob, if you're, I mean, you're sort of at the very beginning, but ah, uh, it's also kind of nice because you're like visiting old friends. Yeah. Right. Like I wrote a whole other book in between, and I'm like, oh my god, there you are. How have yeah. you been? Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is like you become so emotionally invested in those characters. Like I, I agree with you. I feel like I owe readers who love the first book uh, a second part if they want it, right? Yeah. But I owe these characters that I've created, you know, an extension of their lives. You know, yeah. because you know they they do mean a lot to me as well. So it's it's cool to have that opportunity. Absolutely. Is that your baby I hear? Yeah, they just went and picked up uh, Jequis from uh, from school. Oh my god, <laughs> I love them. Jequis. Okay. 
Is he like, no, I'm not coming on your Zoom, Dad? He's just taking his shoes off. He might be up. We'll see. All right, good. <laughs> I'll virtually pinch his cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shree, you kind of answered this question a little bit um, in, in your last response, but we've had lots of questions about how much of yourself lands in your writing and some um, questions specifically for Wab about how Evan is potentially based on him as he's the father of two children, one at the time of writing. Um, so we're just wondering how much of yourself goes into a character or, um, yeah. Hmm. Um, I think indirectly a lot. Uh, and that probably happens in sort of subconscious ways. You know, people ask me a lot if, if Evan is based on me and he's not at all, you know, uh, Evan White's guy, I mean, the protagonist in Moon of the Crescent Snow. Um, but, you know, he's everything that I value in a good community member. And he's inspired by the people that I grew up with who do good things in their communities, right? And the people, you know, I, I want to sort of emulate. Um, so I think, yeah, it's about being a good community member. <laughs> and and uh, sorry, the New the junior kindergarten is running running around here. Um, <laughs> it's also, yeah, it's also that it's, it's thinking. Hey, hey, just leave leave him alone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'll make him come say hi in a minute. Uh, but yeah, you know, for me, it's it's yeah, it's just about making characters that I you know aspire to be and and would like to be in terms of the the good ones, right? So I think that's where that comes from. I think, you know, for me, um, I I didn't see Evan, I was able to, you know, sort of keep you and Evan separate until it came to his relationship. Mm. Until Evan started talking about his partner and the ways in which, um, you know, he had this total, like, complete, well-rounded respect, uh, as well as love, different layers of love, but the ways that he spoke about his partner, I was like, oh, okay, that's Wab and Sarah. <laughs> that's that's where I I heard your voice, and it was beautiful because I cool. you know I love you guys, so it was it was really nice to have that oh, moment. Wow. Um, but for me, that's yeah, there was there was parts of it everywhere. I was like, oh my god, he's the ultimate Indian. Like, I wish <laughs> he was my brother, or my husband, or something. But but when it came to that discussion, that's where I was like, oh, there's Wab. I hear him now. Oh, cool. <laughs> Oh, oh shit, should I answer? Uh, how much of, uh, of me is in my characters? Hopefully none, because they're all really good. <laughs> uh, and people have asked me this too, you know, um, and there is this assumption. So one uh, book that I, I, I wrote, uh, Red Rooms, um, some of the characters were, you know, street involved or involved in the sex trade industry. And, um, um, you know, just coming from diverse backgrounds and experiences. And I read an article about um, me where it was, you know, basically saying like how great it is that someone could come from, you know, these, this horrific background and achieve writing a book. And I was like, I lived in the suburbs, dude. I don't, this isn't me. Like, I thank you for thinking that it's, you know, as horribly realistic as, you know, to assume that I have those firsthand experiences. They are, you know, experiences that I researched and, and are stories that were given to me um, to, to push forward. Um, but, uh, yeah, there was just sort of this assumption, um, which I took as a compliment. I mean, I'm like, wow, that's, thank you. But, um, you, you have to have, and I think, I love that you say that it's, um, your characters are who you aspire to be or who you look up to. Cause it's the same for me, even the villains. I have to say, I love writing a villain. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Dude, yeah. I love writing the hell out of a villain. And, and, you know, I, you make the, the, the trick to a good villain is don't make them two dimensional, first of all, mm -hmm. but make them truly believe. And I got this from Scott, the, from Justin Scott was he truly believed that he was doing the right thing, that these Indians were lazy, that these Indians couldn't hunt, they couldn't take care of themselves. And they needed him mm -hmm. as wrong as that was, as much as he was the burden, he really honestly couldn't see it. And it mm -hmm. made for a compelling villain where you can you can understand that he's passionate about this. He is doing the right thing. And so in a way, I mean you're so happy at the outcome but you're also like, man, at what did at any point did he doubt it? Did he, you know, was there a moment? Was there So any so even even the villains are people I sort of like, yeah, I wish I could have that kind of conviction. I can't even like, you know, go f do 20 sit-ups a day. I'm like, <laughs> I got no willpower whatsoever. Yeah. Frig. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have one more really quick question before we go. Both of you are storytellers, and there's a question about the artwork that you put on your body and how that artwork represents stories, and if there's any stories that you would be willing to share uh, about your tattoos. <laughs> um, I, I, maybe a little bit. Like, that's Wasoxing. That's the island that's, you know, where I'm from. Um, but also, that's just, whoops. That's just a W for a while. That doesn't really mean anything deeper than that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's there's like a sweat lodge and like the four directions. So, um, oh, well, and obviously this this is a Norval Morso piece too, right? So, yeah, for me, it's, it's paying homage to background in a lot of ways, but also having a cool design on you and appreciating the artwork too. Um, but yeah, stories come, come, are attached to that naturally. You know, you talk about, where you were when you got it, you know, I, both geographically and at that point in your life, emotionally and mentally and, and so on. But uh, yeah, yeah, I guess we both. <laughs> we're such stereotypes. Like yeah. We're from the same uh, uh, area. I don't know if you can tell we're very different. <laughs> my, my favorite is when Wob and I go somewhere and we both identify as half breeds and people look at him and then they look at me and they're like, Really? I'm like, no, I swear to God, we are. Sometimes you get like, wait, this direction. Sometimes you get like super high cheekbones, like stereotype. And other times you get like, yeah. It's like it, rolling the dice with the uh, gene, right? Right. <laughs> my, my brother, this is a total aside, but my brother and my cousins used to tell me that I was adopted because I was the only really fair one with, you know, and I believed them for years because they're like, look around you. Who do you think belongs here? And I was like, oh my God. Anyways, tattoos. Yes. Uh, so I wrote all the time when I was young, all the time. And my mother, in an effort to get me the hell out of the house, I don't, maybe I was annoying, I don't know, used to be like, get the hell out of the house, go ride your bike, go down to the lake, go do something, go visit your cousins, please. And, you know, enough. And so I would go out, but I would always have a pen with me. And so uh, I would, full disclosure, just go somewhere and write. And if I didn't have anything to write on, I, I wrote a story on the bottoms of my shoes because it was they were white soles once and then rode home with my feet turned this way on my bike and I fully crashed. So don't do that kids. Um, but then I, I would write on myself. I would, I would write and then come back and sort of transcribe it. So it started very early of me just, you know, just being a, would probably look like a really crazy kid walking around with words on me. So it wasn't a big change. And I think most of, you know, my work is an, is an homage to, uh, you know, I got typewriters and, Another typewriter. Oh, there, there's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Oh, nice. I have a Anais Nin, uh, Charles Bukowski quote. A lot of it, and this is a, an Anais Nin quote, living in every cell. Um, and then I have like my, my dotem, my clan on here. And these are the newest ones nice. um, uh, with the books. I don't know. It's it's kind of becomes an obsession. And it is a, it is a story. Uh, and it's marking. And I think that's that's the part of, uh, you know, there's two parts to being a storyteller. One is, you know, the part where we do this, where we share uh, and we, you know, publicly carry stories. And, and it is our responsibility um, to carry stories. And I wish we had more time to talk about adaptations, which we will find time. But, um, you know, about how you're, re you're responsible, then you make those stories, but you have to then carry them as far and as well as you can in, in a good way. Mm. So that's part of the responsibility. But the other part of it is marking time, mm. right? So so creating maps, so so uh, having signposts and reminders and and even those those kinds of, and I think this is where it becomes important for indigenous readers. If you're walking down this hall, say, you know, and right now it's kind of a dark hall, our responsibility is to to mark time so we know the distance we've come so we never forget how far we've come and to knock windows into the darkness, especially for indigenous readers, mm. so that we can see a little ways forward. And that's what a good story does. And so marking time, um, you know, I think for us, uh, you know, Wab and I continue to collect ink and we continue to write. It's just, that's, it's just a part, it's an outward expression of that, that journey moving forward. Mm. It's a very lofty way to say we like tattoos, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both very much for your candor, for sharing, for all of the laughs and the great discussion today. We've all really appreciated it. All the comments today have been just so positive.
positive about the two of you and the relationship that you have and how much they've loved your books. So thank you both so much for being here today. Uh, I just want to remind all the viewers that you can join WAB again tomorrow night in conversation with Jesse Thistle, author of From the Ashes. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we hope to see you back here tomorrow night, but that's all we have. So until next time, everyone, happy reading. And thank you again to our authors for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.